Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey there, and welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Hey, thank you so much for picking our show because we all know there's like over 2 million podcasts that you can choose from. However, this is the one that's for people who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, go visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show with Craig Brown, an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig. Hey, Tom. Good to hear your voice, as always. Looking forward to the next battle. Here we go. That's right. This is another one of our digital battles, which means we are joined by the trustee for content from the Digital Enterprise Society, Mark Pendergast. And Mark has many years of experience in and around product lifecycle management, and he joins us here to duke it out every few weeks with Craig on topics that are happening in and around the world of PLM. And today, we're going to talk about customer and supplier relationships dynamics, and how much should they share with each other? Ooh, this this sounds like it's going to be fun. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah, it's fun. Just do what I tell you. I'm the OEM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Craig, Craig and I had many, many years of duking this out for real. So I think uh, this is probably a, a good opportunity to maybe uh, re- resharpen some old points and uh, get some old get some digs in from, from our previous lives. Nice. Well, <laughs> well Mark, I don't want to play favorites. And since Craig is my co-host every single week, I'm going to start with you. How much should customers and suppliers share with each other? I would say as little as possible. Uh, right now, you know, representing kind of the supplier community, uh, there's just too many downsides to sharing too much information and uh, too little to gain. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a nice as a supplier to work with a black box relationship and uh, well-defined interfaces. And uh, experience has taught me Sharing too much can get you nothing but trouble. Huh, Craig? Really? Craig, wow. I, th- I think you've got a different opinion. I don't know. What do you think, Craig? I think as long as he owns all the liability, the liability of his black box, as well as all the problems it causes in my vehicle, then I'll be glad to let him behave that way. But that's not the way the business works, right? The, the, the ultimate value is in the customer's hands, which we're both trying to support right and 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 sometimes especially the car business which we were a part of for a long time um you you need to be have clear responsibility so what the oem our quality people they want to see enough detail of the suppliers parts to know that we can maintain um high quality and and so i think this is part of the dilemma with sharing is of course the the supplier has intellectual property and for lots of reasons, they don't want to share it. And I don't blame them, by the way. I probably agree with that. But they got to share enough so that I know that, that it's a quality product. And and that is pretty hard to do, especially when neither one of us understands the way things might be used. This is especially a problem for new technology, right? If, you know, it's one thing if we do something we've been doing for 50 years, and we know what the boundary is, and we've agreed to the contract and all that. It's a lot harder thing if we're co-developing a new way of doing um, sensing for an autonomous vehicle. I mean, there's a lot of development going on. And I think that's the cut, the crux of the problem is if we're doing co-development, then we got to have a, a way of sharing a lot more information. And and it's a, some of it's design information. Some of it's just, hey, I noticed this weird behavior. I don't think it's my part, but I think you need to be aware of it. So if you're black box, you, you kind of just throw away that insight. You don't really share it. And I, I think this is a part of the sharing that needs to happen is the experience along the way. Um, you're, when you're, when you're developing new technology, you're discovering as you go. And it's that discovery process that we should share a lot. And, and um, I don't know, Mark, what do you think? Do you, you want to share that or do you want that to be a black box too? Well, I, again, I think uh, as from a supplier standpoint, 
uh, we're trying to defend our little niche in the market. And as you well know, when you're supplying to a big customer, it's cutthroat. And everybody's trying to weasel each other out of the business and find a competitive advantage and find whatever. And uh, we have found over the years, you got to keep that stuff close to your vest because it just kind of accidentally comes out over a couple of beers accidentally and you're, you're out of business. So you got to be very cautious about what you share, even that knowledge, because that may be our secret sauce that keeps you buying from us and not from the other guy because he hasn't figured it out yet. Yeah. Okay. We, we got to work on this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that's why we're here because it's not black and white. And there are times when we do work very closely together, but you know, there's been times where we work too closely together and we lose the business to somebody who didn't do any of the investment. So, yeah. so well, this, that's an interesting point. So this is a good segue into my next question. So what are the factors that are going to inhibit sharing? You've already shared some of them, but, but what is, what's really stopping the sharing? So, so Mark's being diplomatic as most suppliers are, but one of the things he's getting to is this whole idea that the supplier shares so much information that you, the OEM, can then go to another source. And, and frankly, that should be disallowed. The OEMs have to stop doing that. And when you run into procurement agents that encourage that, um, you know, frankly, they, they should pay the penalty of, of the lost quality because probably – if you're the leader, you're, you're the tier one that's the leader in this technology, you probably can can demand a, a price premium for that, right? <clears throat> well, you know, if it isn't a key key product enabler for, for a customer's decision, um, you know, the purchasing side of our big companies is going to try to turn that into a commodity, which means you can buy it for many people. And that, so this is why you don't share is, is because the trust is eroded, the, the long-term business trust. And, and when pricing gets involved, especially in a competitive market, um, it's tough, you know, and I, I don't, you know, I've tried, I've written contracts for tool suppliers and, you know, you, you kind of like, well, how do you do this? Well, maybe you negotiate long-term. So multiple products, right. Or maybe you negotiate, um, total dollar volume and not, uh, individual part volume so that you can then build some trust that lets you share more details. But, but I, I think trust is a big part of it and it's not trust that somebody's evil. It's trust that the dynamics of the businesses don't, I mean, they encourage this cutthroat behavior that, that Mark so gently presented. <laughs> so I, I think, I think I'm looking for creative ideas that probably will come from a supplier um, on how do we, uh, you, you know, the factors inhibiting sharing, can we address them? And, and trust, I think you have to go after, um, you know, what, what does each party want? Well, once it's clear what each party wants then make a deal that makes that happen and then get off to get back to sharing so that you can make the quality great and also not take advantage of each other. Yeah. I think that covers some of it. I'll, I'll, I'll say one word and then I won't ever say it again. Lopez. <laughs> oh no. Okay. But, then we'll have to Google GM history Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, that, that I think broke a lot of relationships is sure. that philosophy. Um, but no, yeah. I think you, you covered a lot of it, Craig, it is, is fear that we'll tell you some of our secret sauce, some of our hard work, you know, mm -hmm. some of our lessons that we fought dearly to get with brilliant people. And over a beer, you casually mentioned to some competitors having the same problem. Oh, well, yeah, my other supplier is doing this. Mm -hmm. Boom. I've just lost all that investment in my time and effort. Or another one that uh, you're probably familiar with is you say, hey, this stuff doesn't look so hard. I'm just going to bring it inside and do it myself. Since well, you taught that, me how to do it. Yeah. Touche. <laughs> I mean, the current world, it's not so much the, the car companies doing it, though they still do it. Um, um, but th those of us who, who buy stuff today, because we all stay at home, um, Amazon is doing this really, really well and really, really secretively, which is insourcing the, the kinds of products that people buy more and more of. So they have this competitive advantage because they can see where the, the consumer sentiment's going, right? Mm -hmm. And they vertically integrate around some of those <laughs> where the margins can go up. So yep. capitalism, uh, I mean, is, is that it, Mark, that, that it's really the greed side of this, the, the desire to make higher profits that, that makes uh, sharing 
really difficult? I mean, is it that simple? Because I'm not sure we're going to fix the greed side. At least I don't know how. Yeah. Well, again, the the customer is trying to sh- cut the margin to zero. The supplier is trying to increase it to infinite. There's probably a happy medium in there, but uh, now that we're all run by financial analysts and MBAs, it's drive it to the edge. There you got it, Tom. The factor is the MBAs. Gosh darn it. <laughs> it's always, it's can, you always go, can you go get them to work somewhere else? Yeah. It's always <laughs> we, the darn MBAs that get you, I tell you. Yeah, no, we, we engineers are happy to share. Probably too much. That's part of the problem. That's right. Well, you just said if you, if you give the engineer a beer, he's going to tell your competitor what's going on. So there's your problem. But, so, yeah. but part of that is engineers and discovery. We, as scientists, we love to talk about what we've discovered. You know, there, there was the, this work one went other way. So years ago, in these products where we had digital computers, we had something called RAM refresh. And anybody who's been around for a few years knows why we got to do that. Because memory, people don't realize this, but the way memory works, especially a, a memory called dynamic RAM, it loses memory after a few um, seconds. It's not really seconds. It's really hundreds of milliseconds. But... So you refresh it, you read it, you literally read the cell and you rewrite it. And then so then the chart, it's basically a capacitive charge. The capacitive charge gets rebuilt and you retain memory a little bit longer. Hey, this 20 years ago, maybe more, technology evolved where you didn't need to do this anymore. And so I got a call from you guys, Mark, it was, it was your peers who I'd known for a long time. And they said, hey, are you guys up there in uh, GM still doing this RAM refresh thing? Have you had any failures where it was required and you, you uncovered a, a flaw in silicon or something that, and it was really funny. They called like a month after, no kidding, we had one of the, the biggest recalls on this kind of problem. And you want to know what it was due to? It was due to people exploiting Moore's law. They shrunk the chip and didn't realize the geometry of the power bus to the memory cells was close enough that the, the, the cell lost its memory. So if you remove the Ram refresh, by golly, you know, you're, you as a consumer, you just assume a computer never loses uh, content, right? (laughs) By the way, you know, remember the fiasco when we were all young men where, where it calculated, uh, some number incorrectly, right? That was an infamous Intel thought failure. Anyways, to make a long story short, that practice, you know, do you need RAM refresh in this world where we're mass producing electronics? Well, at least at that moment in time, about two decades ago, we still needed it because we, we got surprised by a electronic hardware change that we assumed wouldn't change the behavior of the chip. And in fact, it made memory retention riskier. So I think when you learn something like that, you know, the guys uh, where Mark worked, they, they thanked me and they said, okay, that's what that's the insight we're looking for. And, and the chip vendors aren't going to tell us. And I said, well, of course, they're not going to tell you. So <clears throat> just think it through, you know, why, why could you do it? They call them die shrinks in the business. How could you do a die shrink and not consider this? Well, you know, 2020 hindsight's great. It's easy to point out flaws looking back. Um, and it's still looking forward and keeping it reliable. It's all of our jobs. So I, I think we, we love to discover and then we'd like to share that. We don't like to immediately write a patent and say, no, Mark, you can't have it. I wrote it down first. I mean, mean, there are people like that, but they don't tend to be engineers. They tend to be people that want to own intellectual property. (laughs) Well, well, you don't see MBAs writing writing, uh, writing, uh, IP uh, patents, but you do see them managing it, right? Oh, yeah, that's our intellectual property. We we don't want to share that. Yeah, well, I guess that kind of goes into another area that, kind of inhibit sharing is legal implications. Well, so yeah, in the country, like, yeah, and, like, and it depends on the country of cell, right? I mean, because it's different in different countries. Right? Well, but, but think of it this way. I'm working with you developing this thing, this autonomous car, and I tell you, you know, I'm really worried about this. We can't get this to work. We're struggling with this, whatever, and the car hits somebody and kills them, and you go, oh, that supplier said he had, his stuff was crap. I, I remember that. I'll testify to it. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's sad. <laughs> All right. So, so, so moving on, we've talked about why people don't share between the customers and the suppliers, but let's look at this from the other side. Where are the big opportunities in the area of sharing? What, why is sharing good? Why should they do it? How can we, how can we exploit this for the good? Well, I, I think, uh, an area where, you know, is a big opportunity that we could improve. And Craig and I have argued this before is requirements. And right now we exchange 500 page 
Word documents <laughs> that nobody can comprehend. Yet behind that Word document is a very sophisticated behavioral model that he could just hand me and say, yeah. here, why don't you why don't you just build something like this? But of course, then he's on the other end of the stick, handing out his intellectual property to me. So so that one's tough. But I think that's a place where you could do, yeah. mo- set, give a model as the requirements rather than give a 500 page document. You know, the, the thing with battling with people, you know, is they, they know your arguments. <laughs> so I, th- we're not going to battle this one. Mark's absolutely right. The industry should figure out how to share more than documents and, and more than contracts, right? They, they should share a framework for modeling. Maybe, maybe we'll call it a framework for a moment. In other words, this is the behavior I think I need for the market. Show me how your part works virtually inside of that kind of a, of a, a, a behavioral model or a dynamic model of how the future system can behave and show me where the limits are. Even just talking about, well, where are the risky parts of the design based on behavior, not based on just ge- geometry. Geometry, we're, we're all pretty good at uh, talking about these days. So I think that's a big opportunity is requirements, models, behavioral models, instead of, of documents. You know, there are people in the business, <clears throat> and I'm talking about the, Mona, the one I know most, which is the car business, but, but the way we work with what I would call them key suppliers or preferred suppliers, there isn't thousands of pages of documents. It's a few pages of key documents and, and the, the trust is being formed. Now there's still the black box attitude about, I don't want to teach you so much that you then take this business somewhere else. Right. But, but I think um, that's one, I, I think another opportunity too, and, and you know, this, this is hard to do, but there ought to be sharing of the benefit, right? Um, if there was sharing of the benefit, then this goes to building trust. So what I mean by that is if there's a feature that Mark's company brings to, to my car company and it ends up being gangbusters, uh, more sales than any of us expected, they should get something in return. And, and part of it should be more business. So more sell more of your widgets, which will probably happen naturally, but it ought to be more than that. So, so that we can build trust. I, I think, you know, when you build partnerships around the world, uh, across industries, even it all comes down to trust. And, and as trust forms, then we'll start sharing more models. Maybe they'll just be the black box, you know, here's the interface, but if we can share the interface and the behavior across the interface, well, then I think uh, we'll get along to sharing sooner. You know, flip it the other way. This recent news about um, recalls of electric vehicles for battery packs, and there's specific ones, uh, and there's, uh, there's, there's general ones, and we won't get into specifics. But you know darn well the team of people investigating that problem and deciding what to do, all hands were on deck. It didn't matter whether you came from the OEM or you came from the Tier 1 or maybe even a Tier 2 that was responsible for that machine in the plant, right? And so... Um, if we could take on the attitude we take on on problem solving, um, you know, when we were all vertically integrated, way back when, when I was learning the business, the rule was simple. You share the warranty equally. doesn't matter whose fault it is. You share it equally. And the whole reason they did that was so that we all would work together, <laughs> right? I mean, it was really quite simple. Um, you know, I, I think you got to get back to that in, and, the, the one I'm that's prominent in the news and about all the hundreds of thousands of vehicles they recalled, look who took ownership of the, the financial responsibility, right? It ended up being the tier one. And so I think, I think that's a, going a long way to trust. Now there's probably also some evidence about who really failed, but, but you gotta, you gotta build trust. Otherwise you won't share anything. Now, other industries, you know, it, it's interesting, Mark. And I, I wonder if you see this from your vantage point, but in the aerospace industry, it's the tier ones that have gone to the OEMs and said, you know, you, you OEMs, if you would just get your act together on model interoperability, we'd be able to give you lower cost components, whether you're Airbus or Boeing or whoever. So you guys, you OEMs need to lead it, but you need to get to model interoperability. And, and you know, the, the car guys, every now and then they talk about it, but they don't really do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it comes down to the fact that if, if you're doing an Airbus, you're building 30 of them. 
yeah. and you're at bigger <laughs> risk for that investment. Whereas I'm building a million of them. Yeah. I'll just amortize, you know, I'll just nick you for another couple of bucks on each one and I'll, I'll come out, I'll survive it. Now I, I, I'm going to change Damn. subjects on you. I'm going to go back the other way. Okay. And one of the things I think that is really getting in the way of, of this, you know, sharing that I would be a great opportunity. And we've been talking about it for 20 years is neutral models. Every, okay. every big customer says you will use my CAD system, oh. you will design to my design well, standards, you will put it in my assembly, and that costs me a fortune because all you guys have different systems. Wouldn't it be nice if we could invest in JT or any kind yeah. of neutral model and say, you know, just give me one of those and that's good enough, and then that would reduce my cost to having to keep 50 CAD systems running. And would you share that cost? Would you share that savings back with the OEM? Well, I'm already giving you back all that savings. So you hammer me down every year. So, wow. So, the, so this is really important, everybody, because <laughs> that is an element of what these aerospace guys are doing. Is the the OE the tier ones are basically saying, um, get this interoperability thing working, then I can lower my cost because I can use my my preferred CAD system. So this, this is a really good point Mark's making. Um, and, and it's interesting, it's the dynamics. Because there's so darn much money in mass production, this, this, the, the financials of this gets lost. It doesn't show up as dollars and cents. It actually shows up as time to market. And, and I, I think if we have, you know, I got all these MBAs we're talking about. If they would think about this currency as how fast I can get to market, then they might actually realize that interoperability is a big deal and it's worth making the deals so that we build trust so we'll share more well and, but, and not not just time to market the first time no time yeah continually time time to change right right so that that's good i, I you know the the car guys for whatever reason then it's not going to happen now given there's more of them right um they're just going to keep saying and probably the economics will never help they're just going to keep saying use my cad system i already figured it out don't don't don't, and I'm really sorry if you got to work with five of us, but there's so much money in the game. That's just the way it is. <laughs> All right. So as, as we look at people finding more ways to share and finding more ways to collaborate on these things, who should really drive this? Should the customers be driving it? Should the suppliers be driving it? Other vendors? Should it be industry associations like the Digital Enterprise Society? Should it be standards bodies? Who should be, who should be driving this sharing? Well, well I'll, I'll, let me start. So... When there's great failure in the world, you get standards for safety, right? And and so, um, you, you know, if you think about uh, electrical things and, and go read about it in the history books when Edison started out and he and Tesla, the other Tesla, not the car company, um, uh, had all these arguments about, <clears throat> you know, what what's the proper way to put the power grid together. There was a lot of unsafe factors and, and other people came along to – to provide safety and how they do that. It was mostly an industry association and a standards body, and it was to improve the public's safety. So I think, and I'm giving you a negative example, but by golly, if we really mess up the safety, then, then it'll happen independent of suppliers and OEMs. However, you would like to think we don't go that way. You'd like to think we're, we're proactive and we figure this out long before that. And so I, I don't know. What, what do you think, Mark? Is there one of the, I mean, would you and I buy a car based upon its um, collaboration measure or, or our sharing measure? I mean, no. we're, we're, we too are part of the problem because we will buy the cheapest one out there because most of them work pretty well. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think it's not a technology issue. So you're really not looking at vendors. Um, you know, it, it's more of a legal issue. One, one place I see hmm. that might be interesting that's really starting to catch my eye is one we, we talked about uh, the last time, which is agile hardware. I'm starting to see a spice functional safety, things like that are working within a company, but you know, the big benefit is when they start having to work across companies mm -hmm. and maybe that's a vehicle, you know, what's your spice compliant process? What's your, what's your functional safety through the entire supply chain? 
you know, today we build those little interfaces with contracts and whatever, but, you know, you'd think you could do better if you could break some of that down. But uh, I think from a leadership role, it, it's, it's just tough. Like you said, it depends on the industry, certainly in automotive. Most of the MBAs don't even know this is a cost. I mean, mm-hmm. I used to complain about it because I had to go buy all these damn CAD systems and keep them running. But, uh, you know, and, and, and deal with your 500-page spec every time it came in, you changed three words, and I spent three weeks trying to figure out which three words you changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think standards are starting to get there. Some of the ISO standards, you know, mm-hmm. quality. Quality is probably going to drive this. I think you hit the nail on it. Quality and safety are going to drive this spice standards. So standards are going to be part of it. But again, because it's a trust issue between the customer and a supplier, I don't know who can mediate that, that relationship. And again, there's bad actors on both sides who are, who are going to screw it up no matter what you do. So, so let me, let me bring in my other favorite topic, which is it's financial again, but the valuation of the electric vehicle startups is just friggin' amazing. And, and we got one this, this week. So by the time you guys hear this, this will have happened. And so we'll all be talking about it in the past tense, but, but the, the Rivian IPO has been interesting to watch the dynamic. I mean, holy mackerel at the rate they're going, they'll be valued at a greater value than either Ford or General Motors uh, when, when it goes public here in a few days. So that's, that's just amazing. Okay, so let me ask consumers, those of you listening, so why would you put all your money over there with an unproven track record? Just because you like things that come out of California or Silicon Valley or you like the buzz, you're just influenced by the marketing buzz and not by the, the, the legacy of the history of of safety and and the response when there is a problem. So I, I, I think, I think uh, Mark, I want you to expand on your, your ACE spice functional safety example. You know, what, who was the catalyst behind those? Was it an industry association? I don't think it was a government though, to ISO's credit, they, they did work through getting a standard put in place, but the international standards organization. So, um, which is it? I mean, who leads? I mean, it's people like you and I, I think, to go to an industry association and do something, right? Well, it's that. I think a lot of this stuff is starting to come out of the EU, and they take personal safety, personal privacy, mm-hmm. personal everything very, very seriously. And they just started saying, you guys aren't doing a good enough job. You aren't looking at everything that could go wrong and doing everything in your power to protect our human beings and to protect their information. And so they started the genesis of what was functional safety. They started the genesis of substance of concern. Now in the U.S., to some extent, we really don't care about our people. They're expendable. They're cogs in the wheels of, uh, of capitalism, and we don't. We don't have those far-reaching regulations that, that, that are coming out of Europe. So I think whatever reason, Europe, just because they got, you know, 10,000 years of history or whatever it is, back to the Neanderthals, they don't look at, they, they consider their people more precious, whereas we tend to have the pioneer spirit of, well, you know, acceptable casualty rates, right? Yeah, well, that's an interesting historical perspective. I'm thinking we need a podcast on the history of why certain regions of the world are safety conscious. Like, it couldn't be because they, never mind, they had a big war. <laughs> it looks like this isn't going to be solved on this battle. It sounds like the, uh, the question of the customer and supplier relationship dynamics, there's still a lot to be discussed. Maybe we have to come back and battle it out again later. I got one last word for you. You know, those of us interested in fixing it, you got to fix the procurement cycle. This, because that's where, that's how the trust will get fixed, right? And so I say it like there's a known answer. There's not a known answer. But sharing models, you know, I share an envelope model. Mark responds with an implementation model. We continue to go back and forth daily with that model. That would be one example of better sharing. Another example of better sharing is when you really do share something with me that's your secret sauce, I never, ever, uh, take it anywhere else unless I pay you a royalty for it. And, and that's, that's the way the system is designed to work, right? The, the inventor gets the rewards, the users get a little bit of profit, but they, they share profit back with the inventors. So that 
those two factors have to be in contracting if you want to get this really fixed. And I, I think we're a long way from making that happen. Engineers can talk about it all day long like we are, but until you get the business side saying, oh, yeah, duh, we're, we are part of the problem. We're going to have to fix this. And, and I don't know how the legal system would even take it. I mean, can you imagine being in a court of law of peers? That's the way our system works here in this country. And Mark and I are very smart, and we say, but I got a view and he's got a view. Well, what's a jury going to do? Well, the legal system doesn't want that kind of ambiguity in a, in a courtroom. They really don't. So then they'll go back to their tried and true practice, which is a big document that's 500 pages long. What was it, Mark? You said you couldn't find the three words. <laughs> so, so anyway, you, you get the point. They, it needs to be fixed in contracting as well, whatever that means. All right, Mark, I'm going to give you the last word. Okay. Well, I think this is a, a great battle. I think uh, Craig and I switched sides a couple of times, but uh, you know, no more than we usually do. Uh, but it's a it's a tough problem, and it gets in the way of digital inf- innovation, digital transformation, and and trust both internally and in this case externally is a limiting factor in our ability to achieve excellence in in manufacturing. Uh, the solution is elusive because we are under tremendous cost pressures and the competitive environment today is insane compared to what it was when I first hired in. And everybody's being asked to hit that next quarter target. And so they sacrifice the relationships to get their next bonus. And it's unfortunate. And as Craig said, it's those guys, the bonus babies that are going to have to solve this because they're going to have to either give up on their bonus, take a longer term view or something. And I I just don't see that happening in the current environment. All right. Well, thank you, Mark and Craig, for battling it out again in another digital battle here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get hate mail from MBAs. But other than that, it was a great discussion. So thank you for well, joining you us. You might also get hate mail from a guy named Lopez, but we won't go there. <laughs> I don't even know what that means and I'm not even gonna Google it. But I will tell you that uh, I want everybody to come back every single week because we try to bring to this podcast interesting conversations that are gonna help everybody enhance and grow their careers. Please join us here every single week for more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. And remember, the Digital Enterprise Society, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.